So welcome to Tea Time with Dr. Tarver. It is time for the tea. I am Dr. Dolores Tarver. I'm a licensed psychologist here in Columbus, Georgia. And we are doing something very special this month in honor of Women's History Month. It is March and we are celebrating all things Black women this month. And to that end, I am going to have live guests for these weeks in March. And we are going to be getting into all of the things related to Black resiliency. We're going to be looking at health disparities, strength struggles. We're going to be looking at faith, ministry, all of these different things that I'm so excited to share with you all because every week we are going to be getting into something that's going to be important to you as you celebrate Black women or as a Black woman, things that you may find very beneficial. So to that end, I want to talk with you about this is live. So you can, for the first time, be able to drop comments on Tea Time with Tar Dr. Tarver's Facebook page and be able to engage live with our guests who I will introduce here shortly. And also, if there are some things that you want to remember from this event and you forget, don't worry because it will still be posted after this live. It will be on all of my streaming sites. So you can get onto YouTube, you can get on Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, Anchor, Apple, iTunes, however you listen to your podcast and be able to access this episode. So don't worry if you miss something and you need to go back and rewind, we've got you covered. So this month, we're going to be doing so many fantastic things. So I want to make sure that you all are aware. So get your paper and pencil out, get your calendars out so that you can make sure that you know what's coming up. If you are here in Georgia, in Columbus, we're having process it and paint on Friday with Painting with a Twist. So that is Friday, March 11th from 7 to 9. Today, we're going to get into health dangers, seen and unseen, risk factors for Black women with Dr. Bridget Jackson. On March 14th, which is a Monday, we will be discussing the well woman, black women and mental health. And that is going to be with Dr. Kimber Shelton, who has written a book that we're going to talk a lot about. We're going to talk on the state of the black woman, March 24th, which is a Thursday. And all of these are at 730. We're going to get into black women of faith, strength and struggles the last week of March and the Columbus Metropolitan Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated will be hosting a virtual forum called Unmasked Saturday, April 2nd from 12 to 2. And that is for young people in grades 6 through 12 or adults, male and female. You will not want to miss that event. Our young people are dealing with a lot of things as we adults are, and this will be an opportunity to really have them talk about their mental health, have us talk about our mental health and wellness, and also talk about suicide prevention, which unfortunately suicide is on the rise in our community. All right, so that's all my announcements. Let's get into it. Tea Time with Dr. Tarver is a wellness-based podcast. It is not intended to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health provider. So I want you all to join me as I celebrate my first live guest on Tea Time with Dr. Tarver, Dr. Bridget Jackson, who has a Doctor of Education in Higher Education and Adult Learning, a Master of Science in Nursing with a specialization in Nursing Education, a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, 26 years of experience in adult medical surgical, surgical perioperative care, neuroscience, and oncology nursing. She has been a nursing educator for the past 16 years, and she is currently the Health Sciences Director at Chattahoochee Valley Community College. So put your virtual hands together for none other than Dr. Bridget Jackson. Welcome to Tea Time with Dr. Tarver. Thank you so much, Dr. Tarver. I'm so honored to be here um, and to discuss these very important issues that are affecting Black women. Thank you so much. I also want to shout out that uh, Dr. Jackson is also a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And so she is also my sorority sister. So it is even more of a pleasure to me that she ends up being my first guest on the show. So let's get started. I know people have signed up. They're ready to go getting this thing going. So let's do it. Well, First of all, I want to start off by talking about some statistics. Now, if you are to just do a quick Google search 
of the things affecting African American women, unfortunately, the top things are going to come up are going to be related to health and poverty. So I want to highlight what those things are looking like. 28.1% of Black women live in poverty. So that is almost, we're pushing a third of us right. are living in poverty. Mm -hmm. Nearly three in five Black women are diagnosed with obesity. And I know that we don't like to have conversations about our weight, ladies, but we've got to be honest with yeah. ourselves about that weight is a factor in these other things I'm about to give you statistics for. One in eight African-American women are diagnosed with diabetes. Cardiovascular diseases kill nearly 50,000 African-American women annually. Of African-American women ages 20 and older, and this is my age group for my podcast, 49% have heart diseases. More than two in five African-American women are diagnosed with high blood pressure. These things are all killers. All of the things I mentioned, poverty, cardiovascular issues, diabetes, obesity, these are taking us out. And so we are going to do our very best today to talk about why and how we can prevent that. So that being said, Dr. Jackson, we cannot talk about any of these issues without addressing that we have some limited resources. Yes. What ways are poverty contributing to why we do have these higher rates of obesity, cardiovascular issues, diabetes in our Black women? Well, with poverty, um, there's a lack of availability um, of resources that support uh, physical activity and healthy nutrition. Um, you know, net nutritious food deserts uh, to where individuals, they may have access to like EBT cards, uh, but because of basic needs, um, necessities that um, either, you know, right now gas, gas is a factor um, with transportation. Um, and so they may sell um, their, their EBT uh, access so that they can have funding for other things that are necessary, um, that they feel may be necessary for them and their family's survival. Um, also, there are um, eating healthy is expensive. Yes, it is. And um, you know, you can go to McDonald's; those dollar menus um, can go a long way to feed a family of five or six. Um, and rather than buying fresh fruits and vegetables and good cuts of meat at the grocery store, um, they opt for fast food. Um, you have a lot of uh, single parents um, that are working and it's quicker for them to pick up something on the way home that they don't have to cook um, for their children um, and for their family. Um, also, when we talk about physical activity, um, not having uh, resources to be involved or to be a member of a gym uh, may affect a lot of individuals. Um, if you know, they're living in areas, um, and oftentimes these poverty-stricken areas are also high with crime rates. You're not going to want to walk around the block if you got to dodge bullets, you know. So, you know, these, these are things that um, a lot of times we don't think about it if we have access to um, good nutrition, um, if we're able to go to the gym or walk in the park uh, for exercise. And, you know, sometimes these uh, just are not available to people that are, you know, lower socioeconomic. And you brought up some really good points, because I think a lot of times when we talk about these conditions, we don't think about the environmental factors that right. affect us, the biological, there are so many things, this is not just one cause that's right. putting us at higher risk, we have all these other factors that we're not considering. And, and the reality is, when you have less resources, you do have to think about what is going to be my priority. Absolutely. And you made an important point. If I have six children and I'm trying to feed six children quickly, where right. am I going to go? I'm going to get, go to where my buck is stretched the furthest. Absolutely. And as you just discussed, bucks aren't stretching as far as That's they right. used to. Uh, we're, right. Our gas is up. Our food is up. We're getting less for things, uh, but we're paying more uh, for them. But they're, they're cutting the quantity down. And we're just talking today about paper towels and toilet paper, and you'll be getting less, but you'll be paying more. Right. And so, and you're absolutely right. EBT cards, like, hey, I know that for some other people, they can take this EBT card and they can use it for things. I can now trade that 
this becomes a commodity for me to be able to get access to gas. Right. Because I have to be able to get to work. I have Absolutely. to be able to get these kids where they're going. And so unfortunately, we're making very tough decisions about how we're going to manage these finances. That's right. And so I guess, you know, as a follow up question um, for people who are thinking about how to manage, like, how do I even deal with all of these things? What are some of the things that maybe we can be thinking about instead of blaming people? Because that's what we tend to do, right? We tend to blame people. The, the conversation is you need to do better. But I'm not actually giving you any real strategies to be able to manage. Like, what are some things that maybe people can think about as they're navigating these systems that they possibly can implement to address this issue of poverty? Well, one of the things I think... Um individuals, especially that um, have like political voices, um, individuals that may be involved in like city planning, um, zoning regulators um, and urban designers, uh, they need to think about the, the standards right now as far as like these poverty stricken areas. Um, a lot of these neighborhoods and communities where poverty is concentrated is like you know, they, they don't have access to um, nice grocery store chains. Um, and, you know, that is something to consider, uh, maybe thinking about uh, mixed uh, economic communities rather than, you know, you have this divide line and then you have poor individuals that live below this line where you have middle class and then upper class, you know. And then also, you know, if there's a mixed community um, as far as uh, socioeconomics, uh, you think about the, the crime. Uh, you're, you're more to see, uh, more apt to see, you know, police response maybe in an area to where there is a higher um, economic um, community versus yes. the poverty stricken. Absolutely. And, and I think that this is where, as we talk, you know, we gave a, a um, an appreciation for being a part of the same sorority earlier. Uh, as we talk about how our community organizations can really help support. So we know that there are churches that have food banks. We know that there are community organizations that get together that raise donations for different things. And I think this is a great opportunity for the discussion about partnerships. Here's Absolutely. how we can partner in our communities because we do know, and the reality is it doesn't take much for you to go and walk around and see where your nicer uh, um, right. grocery stores are or right. your grocery stores that have fresh fruits and vegetables. People live in places where there is, are food deserts. Literally, Correct. they might have a gas station, maybe the closest right. thing to them in terms of them being able to access food. Absolutely. So, you know, us bringing in, uh, you know, some of the farmers, we, we I, I think a lot of us got so hurt when we learned that farmers are literally throwing away right. food that they have left over in excess. Absolutely. When we can be getting together with co-ops, to be able to bring this food in, bring this food in from our, 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 our black farmers, bring this food in from our maybe our small farms. We know that a lot of times the bigger stores, they want to see all of the pretty fruits and vegetables. Right. <laughs> right. And so some of the ones that aren't as pleasant to look at, but still as nutritious for us don't get picked because they're considered the ugly fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Whereas that food could be going into these areas where there is more poverty, where there are more of these food deserts. And we can actually be working together to bring food in. Because if I have access, right, because this is what you're talking about, you're talking about access to things. So how do I get my access? And you mentioned this, like, hey, we have a voice. So as we're talking about electing our city officials, mm -hmm. as we're talking about who we are going to make sure that we vote for, that we need to be in their ears talking about how are you going to address that there is not actually a real grocery store mm -hmm. within walking distance, much less, Absolutely. much less uh, for some areas, not even bus distance for mm -hmm. a family to be able to actually get fresh fruits and vegetables, to be able to get clean water, right? And right. these are real aspects of poverty that we're not, we're not really talking about. People don't have access right. to these things. So even if they were in a position to buy them, they don't have any close to them that they could they could get to. So I appreciate you talking about like, here's some ways that we can work together as a community, because it is going to be us. So oh, we're yeah. waiting. <laughs> <laughs> and right, as we're... you mentioned, yeah, that, and as I think about it, you know, 
if you think about the public housing in our area, you know, mm -hmm. you, there is like a gas station, a convenience store there where you'll see people walking uh, to there. They're coming back with their bags of, of what they've gotten. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll see on the doors, EBT accepted here. Um, and that is where they're getting their, their nourishment, their nutrition. That's what mm -hmm. they're feeding mm -hmm. the family. And a mm -hmm. lot of it is, is high fat, high, um, you know, trans fat, mm -hmm. things that contribute to obes obesity, um, which can lead to other complications as far as with their health. That's a good segue into the next question I want to talk to you about. Black women in particular have these higher rates of obesity. We've talked about the issue of access that could be contributing to why we're not eating healthy um, because we don't have access to the healthier mm -hmm. foods. They're more expensive. Um, and, you know, so we're in situations where we're, we're eating things, like you said, higher in saturated fat, more sodium, um, things that don't have as much nutritional value mm -hmm. to them, not feeling safe to be in my neighborhood. So I'm not really going out uh, because I don't want to get in, in, in the crossfire of a bullet. But what are some things that, as, as we talk further and get into more detail about this, what are some things that you do think are contributing to why we have those higher rates of obesity? Um, I looked up some information um, on Black women and obesity, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health said that Black women have the highest rates of obesity or being overweight compared to other groups in the U.S., Four out of five Black women are overweight or obese. And, you know, a lot of, uh, we talked about diet and nutrition, even though, you know, uh, access may be limited to some, um, if we think about maybe those to, that are able to go and get food, a lot of times our eating habits um, are inherited. Mm. And those eating habits can be unhealthy eating habits. Um, and so, you know, as we have access to um, be able to get nutritious foods, um, I think we need to educate ourselves more um, on what we need to be eating uh, because those um, inherited unhealthy eating habits uh, can be a continuous cycle of obesity. Um, and I know individuals may have like hormonal issues that can cause um, or contribute to obesity, but it's largely food choices and also our lack of physical activity um, that, you know, uh, lead us to be a more obese population. Now you, uh, on my porch ringing my doorbell, uh, talking about the, <laughs> the, the lack of physical activity, uh, but, but also as we talk about these learned habits, and I, a lot of us grew up in homes where you were taught to eat everything on your plate, right? Mm -hmm. Don't waste. Right. Uh, and then as I think about the sizes of plates. Yes. <laughs> right. So <laughs> uh, some of you may remember that that plate was huge mm -hmm. <laughs> that you had to eat a meal off of. I was grown grown before I even understood what a portion size was. Right. That right. was not discussed in my family. Uh, right. I, what you mean a portion size is half a cup of rice. <laughs> what, That's right. Right. And so we're not maybe knowledgeable ourselves enough to even be able to talk to our families about what a portion size is or nutrition labels, learning how to read a nutrition label. I went vegan several years ago and I think, you know, vegan means, oh, automatically you become healthy. There is all kinds of vegan junk. Out Absolutely. there, so just because it's vegan doesn't mean it's healthy. That's and you right. know, I know a lot of us have done the Daniel's fast. Here we are in Lenten season, uh, and and we often get on these things where we, but we don't really understand how our bodies metabolize food. Uh, we don't understand our addictions to sugar. We don't yes. understand our addictions to 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 carbohydrates and sodium. Uh, there's a reason why we crave junk and we don't crave vegetables, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Like we have developed psychological and physiological mm -hmm. addictions to these foods. Some of us are like, I can't have a meal without a dessert. Uh, right. like I got an addiction to sugar. I don't realize nobody ever talked to me about, uh, I love French fries and chips. Nobody ever talked to me about, Hey, do you, do you think 
there might be a reason why you pick those right. two things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but where we weren't, we weren't having these discussions right. uh, growing up. What what are some ways we can really start to have conversations and change that dynamic of we're not talking about how our bodies are affected by food and 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 also this family history of things you mentioned might be hormonal issues right so we're not talking about the things that we have inherited in right. our families so what what can we do to change that as black women well one of the things um I think the more that you educate yourself, um, as you mentioned, you know, being able to identify what is unhealthy um, and limit your intake or consumption of those health unhealthy things. Um, I grew up in a in a household, as you mentioned, to where yes, your plate was hefty, um, and you know, you you ate everything on your plate. Uh, but as I gain more knowledge about portion size, as I gain more knowledge about uh, things that can contribute to weight gain, and also my father was a type 2 diabetic and he was hypertensive, um, I had to make a decision. I, I did not want to be on medications, and he has, used to have a, a slew of them. Um, and I knew in order to do that, I had to uh, change my eating habits. I had to have a mindset to want to be healthy. Um, And that started with uh, changing my diet. Um, When I got up to a just size that I didn't want to be in, and I said I (laughs) wasn't going up any higher, I knew not only uh, to satisfy my physical appearance for myself, I needed to do something to maintain my health. Um, And um, so that started my journey of, um, I'm now pescatarian, have been for, three years, and I feel a lot better. Um, Come on, seafood. <laughs> the weight <laughs> came off, and it stayed off, and um, I'm, I'm trying to get the vegan. I'm getting there. <laughs> That's my <laughs> ultimate goal, but um, I feel that that part of, of changing my diet uh, really mm-hmm. added years to my life and helped uh, improve my my life my uh, you know my my life is I am living it now um, as I said I feel a lot better um, I feel that I can do more things physically and enjoy those physical activities uh, whereas before when I was heavier it, it was a chore uh, to ride a bike with my daughter or you know go on a, a long walk you know but now I enjoy those things yeah you have spoken a word there I think sometimes, we, there's so much information out there, right? And so I want to be clear with everybody that there is no one way to get there, right? There is a lot of different ways that you can get to a healthier place. Um, you don't have to be a vegan. You don't have to be a pescatarian. You don't have to be a vegetarian in order for you to eat healthier, but it is understanding your relationship with food. Right. And a lot of us, um, and it sounds like you're, you're in this space too, a lot of us were binge eating. So we're just you know, I'm eating for comfort. Um, I'm eating because I'm lonely. I'm eating because I'm bored. I'm right. eating because food is there. Uh, <laughs> we got these big old plates in the house. So I'm gonna fill mine up. Uh, you know, some of us used to eat cereal on in, in probably a mixing bowl. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. uh, like this is not an appropriate serving size for, right. for cereal. But if we don't understand these dynamics, then we are not able to talk to our families about those things. And so it's important for us to do a little education. And I know sometimes it can be very frustrating. We go to the doctor um, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the doctor's visits here in the next segment. Uh, we go to the doctor and they say, hey, you need to lose weight. Cause that was my story too. That's why I'm vegan now. My blood pressure was high and, and my provider said, I need to put you on medication. And I said, please give me an opportunity. Uh, to make some changes right. before you go there. Because my fear was once I get on this medication, I'm not going to be able to get off this medication. Mm-hmm. And she was able to say to herself, you know what? I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to have you come back. And she gave me a realistic time frame. She said, I'm going to give you 90 days. You have three months. And within those three months, I want you to track your blood pressure consistently, record it. And I want you um, to also make the type of, type of changes that you need to make. So what, the, what I did, I Googled. I got, mm-hmm. I literally Googled, how do you drop your blood pressure? Mm-hmm. And the, the first thing that popped up was lose 10 pounds. You lose 10 pounds, then your blood pressure drops. So yes. what did I do? I Googled, well, 
what's the easiest way to lose 10 pounds? <laughs> <laughs> um, and in that Google, it was like, uh, think suggestions about how are you eating? What are you eating? Right. And that's what led me, led me to the vegan journey. At that point, mm -hmm. I was the highest weight I had ever been in my life. And, you know, when you have a lot of losses in your life, I had lost my parents and I just yeah. wasn't, wasn't doing healthy things, exercising, mm -hmm. coping, grieving, right. Uh, right? So I was eating, I'm stuffing those feelings and it, it was showing up in my body. I gained probably 50 pounds. Wow. Um, and you can hide a lot of stuff with height, but you can't hide 50 pounds. <laughs> But because of that journey, it allowed me to better be able to understand because I wouldn't have known how to eat different. I grew up in Mississippi. There was pork and there was beef and there was raccoon and there was deer. Uh, and, and, you know, there were all of these. These were meats. And even mm -hmm. though when we moved to Mississippi, we were vegetarian. You can't sustain that. You can now. But you can sustain that back then. Nobody mm -hmm. was eating vegetarian. So my mother started us back eating meat again. Right. And again, you talked about the family dynamics right. in there. Right. And the influence of family. And so now I have to go back and unlearn all of that stuff. Now I have to right. go back and educate myself. And it was hard because nobody else was vegan. Why? Just because I made a choice to go vegan. Um, <laughs> nobody else was vegan. Mm -hmm. And making a space for yourself. Um, I was um, I was just reminded of a of a of a quote, uh, you know, um, from Dr. Uh, Vashti, Bishop uh, Vashti Murphy. Uh, and what she said was black women always need to know when to raise their hand, when to raise their, their voice. Right. Um, and, and, I, and, and I think for me, it was about figuring out what my voice was gonna be as I'm making these healthy, healthy choices. Uh, and I think that's what happened for you too. It sounds like in your journey. Oh yeah. Yeah, like you said, a trip to the doctor. When they told me my cholesterol was up, I knew I needed to do something because that's one of the, the roads to, you know, obesity and the, the complications that, that come with it. So I knew I needed to make a change. Absolutely. So let's talk about the doctor's role in uh, either helping to facilitate change or sometimes being an obstacle, a barrier to people getting the help they need. Uh, so we know that oftentimes we wait to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. We will deal with things on our own. We will carry things. Black women are so used to suffering. A lot of times we don't even know we are. And so by the time we end up going, now I'm 50 pounds overweight. By the time we get up going, now, now my sugar been high. And now I'm having problems, <laughs> right, with my feet. Um, right. by, the, by the time I go, now um, the illness that could have been prevented has spread and now now we're on a higher level of intervention now that's requiring more medication as you were talking about your dad and this host of medications that mm -hmm. he was on. Why are we reticent to go to the doctor, one? And then what are some of the experiences that can either affirm a person during a doctor's visit or discourage a person during a doctor's visit? I think um, a lot of, of the reason why we don't go to the doctor or we're hesitant to go to the doctor, um, we may have had experiences or we may know individuals that may have had negative experiences with a physician. Um, and that kind of, you know, makes us um, not trust them. Um, and, you know, especially, you know, I'm, I'm giving an example, like with this COVID, what's going on now. Mm -hmm. um, I had a number of, of individuals say, you know, well, you know what happened with the Tuskegee experiment and all this kind of stuff or whatever. I'm like, but, you know, they, they kind of associated with that. But if they really go back and look at the Tuskegee experiment, it was with treatment was withheld. You know, they're trying to assist you with um, the spread of this, um, um, this disease that's ravaging um, the world, um, the pandemic. And so I think some people take those negative, uh, maybe they have experienced, um, as you mentioned earlier, going to the doctor and feeling like they weren't heard. Um, and I always tell individuals, if you go to a, a doctor or provider and you feel like you're not, um, they're not listening to what you're saying, it's probably time for you to go somewhere else. Um, because I've experienced that. You go and you tell them your symptoms and it's kind of like, okay, yeah, but you know, and I'm like, well, this is not what I'm here for, and you're not you're not listening to me. 
Um, and so, you know, especially from when they don't know I'm a healthcare provider as well, um, I'm picking up on those cues. And I'll tell you, word of mouth is something else. Um, if word gets out that, yeah, this doctor doesn't listen to me, um, then you got a problem. And I feel that just like you said, Black women, we need to stand up. We need to ask questions. Um, if they're wanting to do a treatment and you have questions about it, get all that information. Um, don't just do the treatment or take this medication because they say that this is what you need to take. Um, and we, we need to be kind of selfish about our health. You're dealing with your health, your body, and to be educated and just get as much um, information as you can about your health. Uh, do your homework. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, you know, if you are having some symptoms, Google it. What might these symptoms be? And discuss your concerns with your provider. And I think that's an excellent point for those of us who are obsessive and like the Dr. Google. I need to Dr. Google and discuss with my <laughs> <laughs> provider, right? So I need to mm -hmm. get some consultations. So if I don't know about something, I'm trying to learn about something, I need to seek somebody who's an expert. But I do want to go back to um, this not being heard. Because unfortunately, I think probably everyone has had an experience with someone who did not hear them. Yes. And in a space that should be a safe space, should be a healing space, should be a wellness space, it is very disconcerting. I think it is um, hurtful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is dismissive. Um, and, and it feels like you are invisible when you go into a space with a provider yes. who you perceive to be an ally. Yes. And this person, you say to them, hey, you told me to lose weight. I'm struggling. I don't know how. Yeah. And this person says to you, well, just eat healthy and go exercise. Mm -hmm. That's not a plan. That's not a strategy. Mm -hmm. Or if I go in and I say to you, something is wrong with my knees. Um, this isn't the regular, y'all know we get them little creaks as we get old. Oh, I'll have to start <laughs> talking to you. Um, this isn't just my regular, I've gotten older, I've, you know, wearing tear on my knees, like some, I feel something is off mm -hmm. in me. I really would like to get a scan. And, and your provider says to you, take some ibuprofen, put your knee up, ice it, right? And being able to find our voice, to raise our hand, to raise our standard, to, rank, uh, to, to, to raise our voice, um, as Dr. Uh, McKenzie said, uh, because I, it's so important for us to feel like we can go somewhere else. <laughs> and I'm so happy to hear you say that as a healthcare provider, you don't have to stay there. Right. If someone doesn't hear you, they don't see you, they don't value you, they don't appreciate you, and you keep coming to them, asking them for things, and they're dismissing you or telling you you're exaggerating your symptoms, it's not as bad as you say it is, you're fine. You mm -hmm. can go somewhere else oh, yeah. for, for people who are struggling with that because I know we think that's rude and and we may also not know where else to go so for people who are struggling with that what are some recommendations you have for how people can stand up with that um well I think um you know when you are going to a provi provider you know, the word, they're providing a service. <laughs> so, you know, just like if you um, are not going to patronize a restaurant, if you are not satisfied with the service, um, you should do the same thing if you are not satisfied with uh, the service that a provider has shown you. And, you know, word of mouth is a good thing. Um, also, you know, just Googling. Seeing what um, providers are in the area um, based off of what your needs are. And when you go to those visits, you know, think about, you know, how, how were you treated? Um, were they courteous to you? And you, a lot of times when you walk into the establishment, um, your encounter with the person at the desk, the first person that you meet, oftentimes can be a sign of how the rest of the visit is going to go. Uh, but after you complete that uh, office visit, you know, determine if, if that's what you would like or if that is who you would like your care to be entrusted in. Um, and if not, let the search continue. 
And I think that's an excellent point, right? So you don't have to keep getting abused. <laughs> you Absolutely don't have to keep, <laughs> keep being Absolutely dismissed. Absolutely not. You, you can, uh, and, and, and I will tell you, one of the main reasons I have left doctor's office is because of their front office staff. Absolutely. If your front office staff is where I went to a doctor's office, and the front office staff, they, first of all, they were very rude. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there wasn't privacy, uh, right. as you're talking to you. That's one of my pet peeves. Don't be asking people personal information where everybody else can see. You know, we, we do have HIPAA for a reason. Right. Um, but then they put me in a waiting room and did not tell the doctor that I was there. And so I'm in this room, which apparently they use to come and do uh, consults and get on the computer or whatever. He came in there after his whatever got done with whatever patients he was seeing and was shocked that I was in there and said, oh, well, they didn't tell me you were here. What, what do you think message that sends to me right. as, a, as a patient um, <laughs> <laughs> about your, your and, then, and then he would never remember anything about me. And I, I, you know, and I understand, like, we all look at our notes before you come in. So I'm mm -hmm. not, I don't have any problems with you taking the time to go look at my chart. I don't expect you to remember, probably see thousands of people. Right. Um, but I do expect you to look at my chart. Absolutely. And not act like this is the first time we meet every time I see you. <laughs> so, yes, you absolutely can get on the, on the internet. You can talk to other people. Hey, who's your, your, your primary? Who's your gynecologist? Who's your dermatologist? Right. What do you like about their office? Mm -hmm. um, you can go and you can look at reviews of offices. And I do understand that people will put negative reviews if they just don't like you, but there also should be some other reviews in there that should right. give you a better understanding of who this person is. You can go through your insurance company who will give you a list of providers. Um, you can um, talk to people that you trust about mm -hmm. a negative experience. A lot of places have where you can file a complaint. There are a lot of different ways you can get information about offices um, so that, that you can be informed before you even walk into a space. Yes. Like, yeah, this place has a history of um, complaints for this very reason, right? So being educated right. before you pick a provider. And um, you shared an experience about your, your daughter earlier. So I'm gonna save this next comment about why it's important, the type of provider that we have. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I will say that I think it's important that you find a provider who has an orientation that fits you. Some yes. of us like it straight, like, hey, just go on and tell me. You don't have to have a lot of bedside <laughs> manner with it. But some of us like people to be a little bit more gentle right. in their approach, right? So those are important things for you to think about. Also being there, like, can I look you in your eye? Right. And do I feel safe enough to be able to share with you? Sometimes we have to share very personal information. Mm -hmm. What if I have to come in here and tell you I have a sexually transmitted infection? Am I going to be able to do that if I don't trust you? Right. Right. So I'm over here suffering <laughs> <laughs> because I don't feel comfortable sharing with you what I really right. actually came in here for. I'm trying to go around <laughs> <laughs> the block and not. Right. So those things are, are very important um, in terms of that. So I appreciate you giving people the opportunity to recognize like. This is about you having the kind of experience you need and you deserve Absolutely. that. So you can, you can switch. <laughs> Absolutely. You can move on. <laughs> That's you can move right. on, Martha. You can move on. <laughs> um, so let me switch gears into something that I know uh, you have a lot of background in, in um, oncology. Cancer uh, is something that affects Black women a, a good bit, as well as infant, infant mortality, right? So I want to... Mm -hmm. Um, throw out, I'm just going to throw out a few statistics. Uh, breast cancer affects one in nine black women. And we're also more likely to die from it. It just doesn't yes. affect us, but it's more likely to kill us. Black women are 77% more likely to die from cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. Black women are three times more likely to develop uterine fibroids. Black women are at high risk to go into labor early. Yes. And we have 2.3 times the infant mortality rate. Mm -hmm. Our infants are four times more likely to die from complications related to low birth weight and twice the mortality when it comes to SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Mm -hmm. And of course, the one that I think resonates with all women, all mothers, African-American mothers are twice as likely to receive late or no prenatal care. Right. So let's get into, let's start with this whole cancer, fibroids, maternal health discussion by starting off with cancer. Mm -hmm. Why are we getting cancer at higher rates? And, you know, 
As far as the cancers, depending on which cancer we're talking about, you know, breast cancer, uh, black women and, and, you know, white women are getting them um, at similar rates. But as you mentioned earlier, you know, black women just uh, do not take preventative measures. Um, we're not um, doing what we need to do to uh, either get uh, regular uh, physical examinations, regular mammograms and pap smears. And, and so by the time these cancers are diagnosed, they are in advanced stages. And it seems like with Black women, uh, research has shown that cancers that affect us are more aggressive. So if you have a more, effect, uh, more aggressive cancer, um, it's going to be harder to treat um, if it's in advanced stages. And oftentimes, you know, the, the black women don't survive uh, pretty much due to that fact um, that the cancer is so advanced that treatment um, is not going to be beneficial because they've waited too late to, to get intervention. And this waiting thing, right, and I, and I will share um, so my mother's side of the family, cancer all through their family, whether that's brain, um, breast, uh, uterine cancer. Um, and, and my mother shared with me that her mother had not had a menstrual cycle still during her, no, 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 wrong way, had started bleeding when mm -hmm. she had gone through menopause already and had wow. not had a cycle. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden started bleeding. She bled for years. Oh my goodness. Without seeing a doctor, without saying anything. And, and um, I think it was during a visit. My, she had asked my mother if she had um, a, probably a cotex. My mother always used to say cotex. I don't care what it was. Uh, she was called, <laughs> called everything a cotex. Um, and she asked my and my mother was like, well, what do you need a cotex for? And she said, oh, well, I started bleeding again. And my mother was like, mama, that's not normal. Like, right. you should not be bleeding again. Mm -hmm. And by the time, unfortunately, she went to the doctor, cancer is all through your body. Yes, yes. When it could have been, if you had gone right away, could have been addressed and treated. Absolutely. But and she was afraid. She was afraid right. to go to the doctor. And I was going to say, you know, postmenopausal bleeding is a red flag for anybody, for any uh, race of, of women. And, you know, um, having regular checkups, that could have been something that could have been discussed at a regular checkup, and maybe she could have been referred, you know, from that. Uh, but we as Black women have got to, whether it's a provider going to the clinic, um, you know, put yourself first um, when taking care of yourself. Uh, we take care of everybody else, but we have got to take care of ourselves um, because we don't want to look up and, and find out that maybe we have developed some condition that could have been treated early, um, that would have had a better prognosis if only we had uh, taken the time to uh, do these preventative measures so that um, it could have been detected early. Absolutely. And I so much appreciate it. And this goes to the communication piece. And we, we talked about communication in our families around eating and, and food and portion size and how our bodies are affected. Um, but I realized that sometimes because of those negative experiences we just talked about with the doctor, where I've been dismissed, I've been ignored. Um, you know, maybe I, I had a, um, we're going to get a little bit into uh, this in a second, so I'm not going to go into it too much, but maybe I had a negative experience when I went to that gynecologist Mm -hmm. um, because they were also my obstetrician and I didn't have a positive experience with them when it came to my pregnancy. Or maybe, and this is a fear for a lot of, like I said, I grew up in Mississippi. Healthcare has not always been the greatest. You all know uh, the struggle is real in sometimes these um, rural South communities uh, or communities where there might be one hospital uh, mm -hmm. or community where you might have to travel far to get to a hospital. The care is not great there. And people think folks go there and die. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if I know so many people who have gone in and not come out, mm -hmm. then I am going to be terrified about going. And we do know that there is a such thing as healthy paranoia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Like the, like sometimes we have experiences that are negative and we need to listen to ourselves to go back to your point about listening to ourselves and showing up for ourselves. I need to listen to myself like that place. Not safe. Right. Right. But. I need to find a safe space. Right. 
right? So I need to be able to, when I don't feel safe there, or maybe I need somebody to go with me um, because maybe I feel like, well, you ain't gonna kill me if it's two of us, um, right? But <laughs> you, had, you had shared earlier, and I want you to talk a little bit about this too, as we go into this whole piece about bleeding just in general with women mm -hmm. and, you know, heavy menstrual cycles and pain with our menstrual cycles and bleeding after menopause, all of these things that are not actually normal, that right. we don't see about, but you shared earlier about your daughter's experience uh, when she was having a heavier flow. So mm -hmm. I just want you to talk about that and then go into why women are dealing um, with all of these kind of issues, like a heavier menstrual cycle, um, like a lot of cramping, like bleeding uh, mm -hmm. during a time when we shouldn't be having a cycle. Mm -hmm. Well, I think... Um especially when we're dealing with our young girls, we need to educate uh, them early. Uh, let them know what's expected uh, with a cycle. Um, let them know that, you know, cramping may happen, but when they have debilitating cramps, um, and meaning you can't go to school, you're missing school or you're missing work, uh, that is not normal. Um, very, very heavy flows to where you're saturating, you know, pads, those cotex, as you mentioned, or if they're wearing tampons, um, and if you're saturating them and you're having to change them so often, um, that is an issue that needs to be uh, told to a provider so that um, you can get the treatment that you need. Um, and I, I shared with you earlier about my daughter was having issues with that. Um, and I had told her what was expected because when I was her age, I had the same problem that she developed, which was, you know, irregular uh, periods, um, prolonged periods, um, heavy, heavy bleeding. And so with that, both of us had to get on birth control pills to regulate our hormones so that we will have a, a more normal uh, period. Um, and, you know, having weakness because you've lost a lot of blood, you know, what type of quality of life is that? Um, you can't, you can't have a good life. You're, you're, you're constantly bleeding and it's not, um, you can't tell when it's going to come or go. And um, all of the other health ben uh, problems that are associated with that. So we need to, you know, be able to tell them this is not normal. And, you know, this is not the curse. You should not be in debilitating pain every month. Um, if you are having um, really, really bad cramps or you are bleeding heavily, you definitely need to uh, tell someone because things like endometriosis, um, endometrial cancer, um, heavy bleeding and pain could be a, a sign of that. But unless you go and get the diagnostics that are necessary to determine that, you know, you won't know. So you need to let somebody know when you sense something is not right. And I want to just thank you for that, because a lot of women, and I've even had um, friends, even in their 20s, had fibroids. They didn't yes. know they had fibroids. That's what was causing all their heavy, heavy bleeding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they thought it was normal for them to be wearing a diaper and a pad right. and a tampon. Right. Um, and then uh, layering up their underwear right. and then putting on some shorts uh, mm -hmm. during during the times that they have menstrual cycles or you out the game for two or three days because your cramps are so bad. Like you literally are in bed with the right. heating pad, mm -hmm. um, unable to do anything sick. Uh, right. So you're missing, you know, there's 52 weeks in a year. So. 12 weeks out of the, out of the year, um, I, you know, I'm not functioning, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm bleeding so heavy that I'm literally bleeding through a tampon, a pad right. and a diaper, right? Like, that's not normal. But I think that if we believe that to be normal, because maybe the women in my family had heavier, uh, menstrual cycles and no one ever got checked right. and asked like, wait a minute now, is this typical? Uh, mm -hmm. for me to be bleeding like this, I know, uh, Dini don't bleed like this, what's going, you know, like what, so these are the things, but if we don't have these conversations, right, if we don't have people in our communities, and I call us gatekeepers, all of mm -hmm. us that serve in a capacity, whether it's at your church, your hair salon, uh, you're in the health field, you're an educator in the school system, you're a bus driver, we are gatekeepers. And so right. as we are recognizing patterns of things and hearing things, this is our opportunity to be able to say, hey, 
like go talk to mom about that go talk to it's not it's not normal baby for you to be bleeding like that right um so talk to talk to your mom about that you keep bleeding through your clothes absolutely right right and you know talking about that may be kind of uh uncomfortable especially mm-hmm. if you haven't um talked about it before but you know talk approach it as early as possible you know i let her know what to expect with her cycle you know at least 2 to 3 years before um it started it was due to start because i didn't know if i was going to be around and when that time came, I wasn't around. Her dad was here, but he was running around like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. But she knew what to do. So, you know, and the same with me. My mom had that conversation with me. So when that time came, it wasn't such a, oh my God, it, it's here, now what? Um, and they will uh, be able to make better decisions. And if there is something abnormal, they will be able to recognize it um, and be able to let you know so that you can assist them with getting the help they need. Absolutely. Like I remember very uncomfortable conversations with my mother before my menstrual cycle started. Mama, why are we talking about this? <laughs> right. um, but, you know, I recognize now she was giving me education so I right. would understand because all of us, our menstrual cycles come on different. Right. And so at, there wasn't red blood. Like what? I, oh, is that blood? That's dark. What is that? <laughs> uh-huh. right? like, um, so, you, you know, being able to just say, hey, mama, like, and it was uncomfortable, but I knew she right. was a safe space. Mm-hmm. And I knew that she was going to attend to me. And I knew that she was going to yes. know exactly what to do. But also just conversations about vaginal health in general. Like, right. you know, how am I supposed to know what my vagina is supposed to smell like? How am right. I supposed to know if something's wrong? Or, like, so, you know, it's so many one of the things that I, you know, I, I figured, I figured out things so much later in life because my mother with her cotex, they were unscented, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so I never got a, a, a bacterial uh, infection from a scented tampon or a scented because we, she bought all that stuff for me. Right. It wasn't until I got to be older and she had conversations with me about douching and all of these like, hey, look, like warm water and soap is all you need. You don't need to be, you don't be putting everything in your vagina, right? But if we had not had those conversations, Mm -hmm. then I wouldn't know, like, when are things off? Mm -hmm. You know, how many of us get to a point where the first time you have a yeast infection, you're like, what is, what what is this? This ain't, something's wrong, right? (laughs) But if I, but if I don't know what normal Right. And it's I'll, like what the appearance looks like. Yes, absolutely. Look, get a mirror and look and examine. Come on, saints. Eyes. That's right. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, if you notice something that if you're not looking at it, maybe it's not painful. But if you look at it and if it wasn't there before, that's something you need to tell somebody mm-hmm. about. So, yes, knowing what is normal versus abnormal is really, really important. Absolutely. And you're right. Like they are uncomfortable, but they mm-hmm. get more comfortable the more you realize like oh everybody else go through this too everybody (laughs) everybody else is is trying to figure these things out too or had to figure it out right so I'm not by myself and there is something to be said about normalizing being a black woman that's right (laughs) yes girl uh you're gonna get some pain in your breast and you're gonna be like why does my why is my breast Mm -hmm. um yes girl you're gonna yeah when your menstrual cycle first comes on it's gonna look a little different and as mm-hmm. you get older and you, you have children, it's going to look a little different, right? That's right? So all of these things. But if I know what to look out for and I know how to take care of my vagina, then right. when things happen, I'll know. You're right. right. Like, hey, that wasn't there before, man. It hurt. But it wasn't there before. Right. What is it? What's going on? Right? Right. So I don't wait. That's right. To go back to that conversation about mm-hmm. let me not wait to go and see someone. I know my body or I'm learning how to know my body and mm-hmm. so when something is different in my body that's that me knowing how to okay hey let me use my voice and check in because I'd rather right. be checking in and, and somebody say oh yeah hey that's normal you're gonna um, experience these kind of things because of you know all our vaginas look different but right. you wouldn't know that if you ain't never looked at your vagina that's right <laughs> <laughs> right like this is normal for you and you're like oh okay then right I'd rather have that conversation then right now how long ago did this start Right. Um, it's been a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Well, you know, unfortunately we got some, some bad news for you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Talk to me about the switch into this higher rates of death during childbirth, mm-hmm. higher rates of infant mortality, higher rates of negative experiences with healthcare providers in general, but with pregnancy, labor, labor and delivery specifically. Mm-hmm. 
talk to me a while about Black women and the health disparities that we are experiencing when we're pregnant. Pretty much in a nutshell, it's, it's like medical racism. Mm -hmm. um, and an example is uh, Serena Williams, very mm -hmm. well-known um, mm -hmm. athlete, world-renowned, mm -hmm. spoke up about complications that happened to her after she had birth via C-section. Mm -hmm. um, she was having symptoms of um, a pulmonary embolism, which is a clot uh, in the lungs. And she got short of breath um, and she was trying to tell the nurse her symptoms. Mm -hmm. The nurse was contributing her behavior or how she was acting to her being on pain medicine. Mm. And so, but, you know, a prudent nurse would mm -hmm. know that if you've had a C-section, you're at risk for this. And the signs and symptoms that she was displaying are, are a possible complication of a C-section. Mm. Um, oftentimes when I talk about women not being heard, um, their symptoms when they're pregnant, um, when they are, um, you know, after they have their baby, especially immediately after when complications can arise, uh, they're kind of brushed off. Um, they are ignored. Mm. Um, there have been studies to show that um, women, Black women um, are forced to deal with gender and racial bias when it comes to medical issues. Um, and especially when we're dealing with, you know, childbirth, they're thinking, mm -hmm. oh, just, they're just emotional. They're, you know, but there have been horror stories of women having complications that were ignored and, you know, the women didn't make it. Um, and so, you know, some of the the, the biases I think that women are facing now, um, a lot of it comes from they're dealing with individuals that can't relate to them. Um, they, they don't feel, I've even heard um, stories of people saying that they felt that black women's pain were different than you know white women's pain. Where did they come from? Years and years of, of racism. Mm -hmm. So I feel that, you know, um, within, when we talk about childbirth, when we talk about mortality rates of infants, a lot of things go um, ignored. And I do feel that it's because of medical racism. Yeah. And that's real. And I appreciate you being honest about that. There's mm -hmm. no point to us sugarcoating it. Yeah. There is absolutely a, an assumption that mm -hmm. Black women are strong. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that we can take more pain, mm -hmm. uh, that we are built different. I mean, and you can even see that uh, bias in, in, you saw it in the Olympic games. You see it mm -hmm. when uh, black mm -hmm. women athletes are competing. You all have an unnatural uh, advantage. We saw two African women um, because their testosterone levels naturally, naturally, they take nothing. Right. <laughs> testosterone levels uh, were higher than they weren't able to compete. Um, you know, so people are always telling us that there's something abnormal about us. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. you're abnormally strong, you're abnormally fast, you're abnormal. Mm -hmm. So that gives people in their mind permission to be dismissive of us when right. we present. Mm -hmm. and, and there's bias about us complaining. Absolutely. And, and a, an example of that, I have seen nurses withhold pain medication from sickle mm. cell patients. Mm. Say that they're drug seeking. Well, if mm. they're in the hospital for a sickle cell crisis, um, I feel that, you know, their pain is what they say it is. Mm. And we got to remember, you know, these individuals have been living with pain their whole life. So how they may display it may mm. not be how you think it ought to be displayed, but we have to take a person's uh, pain level as what mm. they think it is. And if they have the medication um, ordered for the pain, mm. you know, who am I to withhold it because I feel like that they're not hurting? So we, you know, we have to um, be advocates. And I've been an advocate for mm -hmm. patients like that uh, to where if I knew a nurse was, um, when I was on the floor, if they were withholding pain medication or I heard that, I went to the, to the charge nurse and told them, you know, what was said. And, you know, that's not how we treat patients. So yes, it is, it is a difference. Um, like you say, they feel that we are like superhuman. Mm -hmm. We don't have the same pain sensation yes. as other people. Yes. It's just ridiculous. Yes. Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> it Absolutely is ridiculous. ridiculous. 
And then I think that's why it's so very important, um, you know, as we uh, wrap this up and talk about strategies, you all know on Tea Time, I like to make sure that you're leaving with an action plan. Um, let's talk about what are some things that we can have as a part of our healthcare plan, whether that's our preventative healthcare plan. So I'm not having to deal with these longer term issues uh, mm -hmm. because I waited to go for whatever reason, um, or in terms of, I don't wanna be dealing with any healthcare provider who's not gonna be supportive of me for any longer period of time that I can, uh, that I have to. What are some of the things that you would encourage women to have as a part of their healthcare plan? I would say, um, hold yourself accountable for you. Um, and you know what, um, what your healthy is. You know, some people don't go to the doctor until they feel like, you know, they're at death's door. Uh, they feel like if I don't know that I'm sick, you know, it's okay, out of sight, out of mind. But we have to be accountable for ourselves, for our health, um, have some type of motivation to why you are going and getting routine checkups, whether it's for, you know, your loved ones, whether it's for, you know, whatever, you want to see your, your grandchildren. Have some type of self-motivation uh, because, you know, us putting off things for ourselves and taking care of other people, we could end up being the one that needs to be taken care of. And so to prevent that from happening, we need to make sure that we um, educate ourselves, um, and, you know, try to make the best health choices for us so that you have a productive life. I appreciate the finding your why, right? Because I need to know why I want to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> me knowing why I want to be healthy is going to hold me accountable. Absolutely. So I love that. If I want to be able to spend time with my kids, my grandkids. Right, right. Um, I want to be able to be around and reach these goals that I have for myself. I don't want to be, you mentioned this earlier, out of breath, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, when I'm, when I'm doing things. I want to be able to ride my bike with my daughter um, and not be out of breath. I want to walk up these stairs, That's uh, right. you know, and mm -hmm. not be out of breath. So I think finding that why is absolutely number <clears throat> one. Why am I important? Because that's the conversation we need to first have with ourselves is I matter. Right. So if I matter, then that means I need to be investing in me. And if I'm investing in me, that means I need to have a health care plan. And my health care plan needs to at least include the reasons why I want to be a healthier person. But I also heard you say it's important for us to have some accountability. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a part of that health care plan does need to be other women, does need to be right. other people in our families, does need. And this is where this communication we talked about earlier is very important because I sometimes, because of the way we're oriented, because of the way we're socialized, uh, sometimes will value and prioritize other people over myself. Right. So if I know that you are <laughs> holding me accountable and you're saying, right. mama, hey, you said we were going to start walking. If I say, right. hey, mama, you said we were going to have a meatless Monday. If right. I say, mama, you said, hey, we were going to go from whole milk to uh, reduce fat milk, right? Then I have another reason for my why. And I have um, some people right. that are going to show up uh, for me. Um, right. How do we identify people that we are going to see, these providers? We don't want to be with providers who aren't going to hear us, who aren't going to see us, who are going to invalidate our experience, think we're superhuman. Mm -hmm. How do we identify these culturally responsive and appropriate providers? And you mentioned a few things earlier, mm -hmm. um, and I just want you to highlight those again for people. How do they know where to go? Well, um, if you've had a negative experience, um, you know, it's kind of like being in, you know, a relationship, you know what to look for the next time when you choose somebody else. Um, you have got to um, do your research. As you mentioned, word of mouth is great. Uh, look and see how these um, providers are rated, what, what types of uh, comments are left. Um, Find out, you know, as far as, like I said, that that first visit in the office is a telltale sign of how the, the visit is going to go. And, you know, you want to find somebody that's going to listen to you. Um, you don't want to be talked to or down to uh, when you go and you're seeking um, health care. Uh, you want to have somebody that mutually uh, respects you and, um, and is willing to listen um, to what you have to say. 
Absolutely. And I, again, and I want to highlight for people, like if you want somebody that looks like you, you now have the opportunity to have that. You have yes. so many healthcare providers now that are black women. So yes. you don't have to travel 60 plus miles to get to one. And so I mm -hmm. think it's important, you know, you all go to church with some healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. You all go to the hair salon with some healthcare providers, right? Some healthcare providers are in your exercise group. Some healthcare mm -hmm. providers are in your sororities. Some healthcare providers are in organizations that you're a part of. So making sure that you know who the healthcare providers are in your area. Now, don't get it twisted. Just because they look like you doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be the best fit for you. <laughs> right. Right. So you want to just go beyond that. But I, if that's the space you feel most comfortable, I want you to have that. And I want you to have somebody that's going to listen to you, hear you, has good office staff, is not mm -hmm. going to forget that you're sitting in the waiting room. Right. So it's not just about somebody that looks like you. It's about somebody that looks like you that's going to hear you, as Dr. Jackson said, respect you, value you, and show up to be an advocate for you in the space. Yes. yes. Dr. Jackson, when a person, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, as you mentioned, that those were some of the qualities that I was looking for when I did look for a uh, physician for my um, daughter with her issue. Um, and we did find a uh, pediatric gynecologist that is local uh, that just so happened to be a Black female. And I knew that my daughter would be more comfortable going to her and talking to her um, and could re because the physician would relate more um, and be able to discuss freely with what was going on with her. And so, yeah, she, she is very pleased with the care that she's received. Thank you so much for that. Because how many of y'all knew that we actually had a pediatric gynecologist in this area? I didn't, <laughs> right? So this just goes to show the more you talk and the more you engage and the more you show up in spaces with other Black women, the more you can learn. So somebody yes. that you know may need a pediatric gynecologist That's who right. is a Black woman and boom shakalaka, we have one <laughs> in right. this area. Um, Dr. Jackson, what are some people's, um, I guess, recourses of action if they do have a negative experience? What can we do? So if we have somebody that, that disempowers us, what are some ways that we can feel empowered? How can we proceed forward? One of the things um, I know you mentioned before about being able to um, voice the concern, I think being able to let that particular provider or office know about your uh, displeasure with the service that was provided um, is one thing that you could do and, and do it in a, in a, a nice way. Um, but, you know, sometimes they may not realize what the perception of the, the people that they're serving is. So, you know, letting them know that for one, but also, you know, go and um, do your research. Like we said before, um, if you are looking for someone and you possibly know people that have gone to a certain provider, ask them. Um, or either people that you know and trust, ask them who, who they see. Are they pleased with the care that they're given? And, you know, you can maybe see if they are a right fit for you. That's excellent. I think a lot of times we don't realize that we can have conversations with people. Mm -hmm. Somebody got something wrong, you can have a conversation with them about it. And, right. and, and to me, I like to, um, in a space where I feel like a provider can hear it, because sometimes there are, there are missteps. None of us is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that as a provider, I haven't gotten everything right over the years. And I've appreciated when people have said, you know, something happened last time and I've been thinking about it. I wanted to talk to you about it. I appreciated mm -hmm. that. Like, yes. oh my goodness, I was not even aware, right? This is a way to educate. Now, mm -hmm. I don't want you to feel like you have to educate anybody, <laughs> right? So if you're not in that space, if it was a negative traumatic experience for you, mm -hmm. these people almost killed you, please do not feel <laughs> like you need to go and have a conversation with them. Right. But everybody has a licensing board. Everybody has some office staff or somebody that handles complaints. Do know that you can always write a letter, that you mm -hmm. can send an email, that you can give this information factual, detailed information about everything that happened in your experience, and also how you would like it to be rectified. Because I think right. sometimes we don't say that part, right? That's the empowerment part for us. Mm -hmm. How can we address this? How can we fix this? How can you right. make sure you don't do this to someone else? Right. If it is absolutely egregious, 
then you know that you can go to a licensing board. Um, mm -hmm. You can contact an attorney. You have some options like that. But a lot of times for things like you done, your staff left me up in this room and didn't tell you, I'm going to need you to handle that with your staff. I won't be back. Right. right. <laughs> because do know that you can tell people what they got wrong and not come back. Right. So right. I, I also know I also want you to know that you don't have to continue to be re-traumatized by anybody. Absolutely. And so. if they're a good provider, they're going to take that uh, complaint that you gave them. And like you said, it, it's going to be a, a learning experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, how do we address mistrust? So if we're fearful. We had a negative experience. We're scared that we're going to get um, some negative information when we go, because sometimes we don't want to know. Like, I don't want to know. It's going to be bad. Like, that's going to make <laughs> it not bad because I don't go. Um, but what are some things that we can in do to increase us going earlier? Talking to people sooner, showing up, talking to people at all, because some of us won't even go. What are some strategies you might recommend for, for addressing those fears? Well, as we talked about um, earlier, um, not knowing can be the problem. And, um, you know, you gave a, a prime example of your family member that did not say anything about the, the bleeding after menopause. Um, when things change, no, nobody's going to slap you on the hand if you ask a provider and say, hey, is, is this supposed to do this? Or if you make an appointment just to, to get some information to see, um, is this normal? Um, because if we don't seek help early, that could end up being our detriment. We could end up uh, dying because we did not go to see um, if we had this pain, that that nagging pain that came and, you know, came and went, or um, maybe you had this wound that, you know, it, it's getting darker and darker, and now you're oozing, and let me do some, you know, home remedy to it. No, let's go to a provider and get some information so that we can possibly save a limb, or we can possibly save a life. So I think the earlier that we seek um, uh, um, medical attention and not have the thought that they're out to get us or there's some type of conspiracy theory, you know, that, that um, they, they're going to mean us harm. Um, if, you, if you are experiencing something, don't hold it to yourself. Uh, that's why they're there. And I think we need to take advantage of that so that we can, you know, have a, a healthy life, live as healthy as we possibly can. Absolutely. So I'm hearing you say, one, if we have identified a trusted healthcare provider, then we know this is going to be a safe space. Right. Uh, and then also, and you mentioned this earlier, having a having an accountability partner. So maybe I need to take somebody with me. Right. Maybe I need somebody to go and hold my hand. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to go on my own because I might get some bad news or I may not. You know how sometimes you're so overwhelmed, you can't even understand what a provider is saying to you. Right. Uh, then I have somebody to go with me. And then the other thing that I heard you mention is the consultation piece. Like sometimes you actually can consult with someone. Right. Like people will call me and they'll say, hey, I'm not even sure like how therapy works. Is this even something I can deal with in therapy? And I'll take a few minutes and talk to somebody about like, yeah, absolutely. That's appropriate to address. What are you looking for? All of these. So you may have resources, again, within your community, within your church, within your sister circles, within your other organizations, where you can ask a question and someone say, yeah, absolutely. That would be appropriate for you to go be seen for. And here are some mm -hmm. names of some places. Right. So again, as gatekeepers, we can share information with people like, hey, I have a good provider. Let me give you their information. I have right. a, a pediatric gynecologist. Let me give you her information. Right. right. So we're sharing these resources with people. And then last up, how can we advocate for our maternal health and decrease these uh, mortality risk factors that we have for our infants? Well, I think, um, as you uh, mentioned before, um, having um, whether it's a, a person that we can have as a support uh, to assist us and encourage those individuals to get prenatal care. Um, when I was going through my practicum when I was in school, you, you, it was unreal how many people were coming in um, that were um, in labor that had not received uh, prenatal care. Mm. Um, and then having, you know, not receiving prenatal care, some of those individuals um, had gestational diabetes that was not treated, which increased their risk for having type 2 diabetes um, after, you know, they delivered. 
um, which could lead to other complications. So just um, being able to um, get the, the proper um, care that's needed while they're pregnant is important. And also following up. Um, there are a lot of individuals that, you know, if they go and, and maybe they get put on medication, um, if they feel better, they won't go back, you know, saying, oh, I'm good, I'm cured now. You have to follow up and make sure that you, as we mentioned before, hold yourself accountable. Um, because a lot of, of these um, um, problems that are happening with our um, women that are dying at higher rates during uh, childbirth and, and shortly after um, are because of lack of education. Um, you know, another example, prime example is uh, postpartum depression. You know, people say, oh, I got the blues. And, but if you're having thoughts of, of harming yourself or harming, you know, the, the child or someone else, that is not normal. That is not the blues. Um, and so just, just educating um, and, and assisting those when they need um, directing and, and, and seeing somebody that's going to, you know, help them with their problems, um, you know, and, and just kind of talking about mental health, you know, people think it's taboo. They don't, they feel that um, there's stigma associated with it. They're embarrassed. Um, but, you know, seeking mental health as well as your physical health is important because they go hand in hand. Absolutely. Now, you know, you're preaching now. Uh, <laughs> but, but I do very much thank you for highlighting that intervention is always going to be after prevention. So my yes. goal is to prevent things prevent. from happening, Absolutely. not to intervene after something has already happened. So the sooner I go when I find out I'm pregnant, the, right. the sooner I find out who is actually a safe space for me to go, the sooner I find out about you know, if we have insurance issues or transportation issues, as soon as I find out the places that can serve me uh, at no cost to me, right. right, being able to identify those places, having those resources, the sooner mm -hmm. I can do those things, the sooner I can get on that WIC, um, mm -hmm. the sooner that I can get um, those vouchers to make sure that I can get those prenatal vitamins that I can mm -hmm. get right, the sooner I can get access to those things, the more likely I am to be able to have uh, a pregnancy that I can see through the term, but right. also decrease some of these mortality factors for me and my child um, when they get to the other side, right? right? So these are important things. And I think it's, it, it is um, something that we have to highlight is that we do wait. We wait and we think, oh, I don't have to go. It's early on in the pregnancy. I can wait. Some people absolutely think that they don't have to go and see uh, obstetrician until they're in their seventh, eighth, ninth month. <laughs> mm. uh, so because again, lack of education. Yeah, right. like you know how much stuff can happen just right. in that first trimester. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so providing that education. And I know sometimes we're scared. So if you've had an unplanned pregnancy um, and you maybe don't want to tell people you're pregnant, you're trying to hide it. And so you're not getting, getting care, but I'd rather you be getting care, even if you're not letting your family know you're getting care. Right. I'd rather be you be getting care and making sure that you're taken care of. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, um, as my first guest on Tea Time with Dr. Tarver and for this first week of great topics that we're going to have in honor of Women's History Month. I so much appreciate your time and your talents. Um, is there any information that you want to share with our guests before we wrap up? Um, just to, you know, just kind of touch back on when we talked about um, obesity. Um, obesity um, leads to so many um, health problems, um, heart disease, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes. Um, and when we talk about prevention, if there is a way that you can, you know, start today, let tomorrow maybe be your first day that you say that, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to change my, my habits, my lifestyle, um, for a, a healthier you, because hold yourself accountable. Nobody is going to treat you like you would. So I think that, um, you know, you need to realize that you are important. Um, you matter to so many people other than, you know, um, just your immediate family. Um, and and just, just put yourself on a pedestal um, and take care of you. 
absolutely. We need you. We need you around. Yes. Uh, so we want to make sure that you're investing in in yourself. Uh, interge- intergenerational health. I saw that on Instagram. Yes. Uh, we talk a lot about intergenerational wealth. We don't talk a lot about intergenerational health. Yes. Um, so we need to be as families passing down being healthier. I want to thank you all for tuning in to Tea Time with Dr. Tarver. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Spotify, uh, Anchor, wherever you listen to your podcast, as well as YouTube at Tea Time with Dr. Tarver. I want to again remind you of all of the outstanding events that we'll be having in this month of March. If you're here in Columbus, Georgia, or surrounding areas, we're having Painting with a Twist uh, celebration called process and paint on Friday, March 11th from 7 to 9. Uh, We just had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Bridget Jackson, Health Dangerous Seen and Unseen, Risk Factors for Black Women. Next week, we'll be discussing The Well Woman, Black Women in Mental Health with our guest, Dr. Kimber Shelton on March 14th, which is Monday at 7.30. The State of the Black Woman will be Thursday, March 24th with Dr. Tia Starker-Glass and Dr. Delisha Pittman. And then we're going to be talking about Black women of faith, strength and struggles in that last week of March. Also, we're having a virtual program, the Columbus Metropolitan Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Saturday, April 2nd from 12 to 2. That is going to be for youth grades 6 through 12th, as well as adults males and females, and we're going to be talking about mental health, as Dr. Jackson was talking about the importance of that, as well as talking about suicide awareness and prevention. We know our young people are going through a lot. We know we're going through a lot, so make sure you put those on your calendar, and as always, like, share, subscribe, get the word out, because each one teach one, right? So we just learned so much today, so please make sure to share this with someone else who could benefit. Thank you all for giving up your time this evening for Tea Time with Dr. Tarver, and I will see you on Monday for The Well Woman, Black Women and Mental Health. Good night, everyone. Good night.